I'm doing magic of the mind. I can do things that it seems like are impossible for a person to achieve, but you see it with your own eyes. Give it up for mentalist, Oz Perlman. The Wall Street mentalist. The mentalist, Oz Perlman. I want more of Oz. Who are you gonna talk to this week? Vince. Vince. Yes. No, no. <laughs> Show that, exactly. what, three different... Show them. Oz Perlman in the house. You need to realize a mentalist isn't what I am. You should think of me as a salesperson. I don't sell entertainment. I sell memorable experiences to audiences. That's a, uh, a provocative statement that you just made. You know what, let's do something cool. You're asking me about mentalism. It's kind of okay. like asking somebody to describe a song. It's not as fun as experiencing it. So how about this? What the f just happened? Man, uh, where to even start? I, uh, I, I guess, I mean, probably Wall Street to mentalism. That's probably something we should unpack a little bit. I mean, talk to me about, that's where we'll start. We'll see where we go. Talk to me about that sure. moment. So, I mean, I didn't really have a clear defined set of what I'm gonna do. Some people, it's amazing when I met people that are mentalists now or magicians who are like, I knew since I was six. I go, dude, I did not know anything since I was six. So I'm blown away that they already had this linear path in their mind. This was always my side hustle. This is how I paid for things because uh, from kind of a young age, I was pretty self-sufficient. I got my first job when I was 12 and I've had a job ever since. Like I worked at a bagel store, I was a bus boy. And, and then at age 14, I started doing kids shows, magic tricks. And this is how I made money to buy more magic tricks. It was kind of a self-fulfilling loop. And then to pay for tuition at University of Michigan, uh, you know, pay the rent and pay the books and all that kind of stuff. So I, I unfortunately didn't have a scholarship or, or, you know, was subsidized that well by my parents. So I was doing this on the side while I worked on Wall Street, not with, the, with a goal. It was not a goal to do this professionally. It's just because I didn't know any other way to live. I always did this on the side. And this is how I met people, this is how I networked. Uh, and I was working so much on the side doing kind of parties. I worked at restaurants. Restaurants were always my big hustle where I'd find restaurants, people that had disposable income, generally speaking like Italian restaurants, steakhouses, corporate expense account restaurants. I realized early on, these are people with big bucks that can afford me for their parties. And so I would go to these places, get a job and start working the crowds. Uh, and it came to a head where I was working so much after my day job and on weekends that I decided, you know, man, I can't have the safety net of a paycheck. If I'm going to do this for real, I got to jump in the deep end. And uh, I went for it um, and, and I quit my job. People thought I was crazy, but I said, it's, it's now or never. And, and I went for it. How, uh, how old were you that time? I was uh, just about 23 years old. So okay. I mean, overall young, I finished college when I was 20. So I worked on Wall Street for about two and a half years. Um, and, and I had a couple of those like epiphany aha moments along the way where I just started to believe, you know, like Neo in the matrix to be a dork. He's like, do you believe? And I didn't really believe, but there went to this moment where I'm like, yes, I believe and let's do it. Uh, and, and that's kind of over time, these little moments that opened my eyes that made me decide to kind of go after my dream. Okay. So a little bit of context. I don't know how much you know about the show, but I mean, this is this is right where, where I want to be here with this show. This, it's already a perfect conversation. You know, what we're looking for, obviously the name Unlock Your Potential is sort of that, you know, trying to distill down the essence of those unlocks or those yep. catalysts or those, you know, sort of really the circumstances around the possibilities for people that go on to achieve, you know, superlative outlier, you know, achieve achievements, achieve achievements. I think I said that in like whatever area, um, because the reality is I believe that every single person listening to this episode has that at least one you know possibility for their future that takes them to someplace incredible, right? And so we're trying so. to find what is it what is it in Oz's story that can speak to where they are and what's possible for them. So that's where I, I, I want to dig in here. Uh, so you're 23 and you talk about this this developing belief. I mean, that's yes. such a such a powerful concept. Uh, you know, Napoleon Hill said what the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Totally and agree. It, you, you clearly illustrate that, but where most people struggle is the belief. Most people can conceive 
of different possibility, but they don't believe. So I'm curious, why do you think you were primed to believe in something that seems fairly outlandish, frankly, becoming a world-class mentalist? So, I mean, I can give you those moments that throughout, like I was one time at a, at a magic lecture, which is where magicians teach other magicians their tricks, which is funny. And I was still working a day job and a guy who was a full-time pro just broke it down for me in a way, because a lot of people, they always think it, you know, it's not me or it's not today, right? Those are the two kind of obstacles. They always like, well, I got to get to this one spot and that's a moving target that you never get to. So I realized where he put brass tacks in place. It was, what are you still doing at work? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, I got a paycheck. He goes, yes, so what? Right? And he just made it. And so, so what would you need to leave? And I made up a number that was just slightly more than I was making at work. And he goes, okay, how many shows do you do right now? And literally all we did was like an accountant, just break down. I do this many shows. I make this much money. Is money really the obstacle? And at that point, that's what was holding me back. It shouldn't have, but it was. And it was a mental like uh, roadblock. And so he just said to me, well, couldn't you get that many extra shows in a year and raise your rate by 10%? And I was like, yeah, but I know it sounds so stupid saying it now, but that's all I needed was somebody who was doing it, achieving it to break it down for me that simply. And for me to realize that's what I need to do. And can I do that? Yeah, I could definitely do that. Now, it, it, that was like one of the blocks, like, you know, in a safe when they hack the safe in the movies right. and they get like a click and then a click. I had all these clicks line up. Also timing, timing is pivotal in life because this was in 2005. It wasn't the apocalypse or like the 2009 great recession. I said to myself, if I quit my job, what's the worst that happens? I'll find another job, right? I didn't have a family. I didn't have big bills. I was in, I was in a good kind of pocket of life where I could take a risk. I could take a chance. I'd saved up money because I'd been working since I was 12 that I put myself in a position to then go after that dream. And then once I went for it, it didn't wasn't like an overnight success. It took the day one when I woke up and, and went and sat on the couch, you know, Al Bundy style, like married with children, not to date myself, like hand in the pants watching TV. If I don't get off my butt and do something, no one is going to start calling me and saying, you're a star. You need to carve out your playbook. And for me, that was kind of networking, which is always find the people that do what you do and are who you want to be one year, three years, five years from now and get on their good side, get them to share their info with you. And that's a, such a secret to success that so many people can do. Like I have mentalists that will ask me, how have you been on TV over a hundred times? And then I'll ask them, how many times have you been on TV? They go zero. I go, have you tried? And they go, what do you mean? I go, how do you win the lottery if you don't buy a lottery ticket? What have you done to try to be on TV? If you don't have at least 20 things you've tried already, then why are you even asking me this question? You can go on LinkedIn, you can go on Instagram, you can find the whole world at your fingertips now in anything you do. And with one hour of sleuthing, instead of TikTok or Instagram, you can find the people that make these decisions. There's like, yeah. there's no excuses anymore for failing. There is just laziness in my opinion. So uh, thank you. That's a, uh, a provocative statement that you just made because I think I mean, the majority of people what, what they they either disagree with it or they don't want to openly agree with it at right. varying levels of resistance. I completely agree with it. It's sort of my my stump speech almost. But I want to ask you this. Um, you say, oh, this guy. Yeah, well, first of all, I love you've, you've illustrated two of the key concepts that we come back to again and again, again and again on the show. One is the power of mentorship, finding something huge, that's huge. already been where you're trying to go. Right. Or at least at least created a model that you can you can emulate directionally. And then the other is the power of proximity. Just getting, like, you're never going to realize an opportunity that you don't come into contact with. So come into right. contact with as many potential opportunities as possible. I love that you went to restaurants where you knew there were people with corporate expense accounts. Um, I love, so, but, but all that to say, I just, while you were talking, I Googled uh, on Wikipedia, the Society of American Magicians. Sure. Oh, I now know that in terms of at least one trade association, there are well over 5,000 magicians in the United States. And those are the people that are like registered and official and part of a trade group. Um, so so you're more than just, a, a, and by the way, maybe let me stop for a sec. Magician versus mentalist. Can you yeah. clarify that distinction for me? So it's kind of a specialist. Uh, so it's it's a difference because most people, when they think of magic, they really have a clear impression, if that makes sense. You've seen David Copperfield, David Blaine, Chris Angel, depending on kind of your generation. 
and you think like, oh my God, they're going to make something disappear up here. It's going to be a card trick. There's a visual element involved in magic where you are deceiving the eyes. You're deceiving what people see. 99% of it. Mine takes out that component. So I'm not designed to have fast hands. I, you, I can do something slow and I can repeat it over and over. You're not going to catch it by seeing it over and over. I'm doing magic of the mind. So it's not like you're a psychic. It's not like you can predict the future. Uh, it's not supernatural in any sense. Do you understand what I mean? That my company is not psychics. I am, instead of doing a card trick, like one of my opening shows that I do, whether it's for 15 people or 15,000, is I'll tell everybody in the audience to imagine they have a deck of cards in their hand. And I go, just pluck one out. Just pluck one out. I go, because I'm not doing magic. I read people. And so now I'll watch that person's expression and I'll kind of start coaxing red, black, hearts, diamonds, club. And just by that, I'll tell them what card they were holding in their hand, an invisible imaginary card. So I can do a card trick with no cards. And that's kind of where it goes. I'll know how people behave, things about their past that I couldn't possibly know, what they'll do in the moment. It's a hyper cerebral experience. It's very interactive. It appeals greatly kind of to corporate audiences because being amazed is universal. And I think people are still looking for what's the power of the mind, especially with technology, with AI, with all these things. I'm staying ahead of the curve where I can do things that it seems like are impossible for a person to achieve, but you see it with your own eyes. You experience it for yourself. And that's why I, I feel like it's had some longevity and it, it, it's a product that sells well. So is, is mentalism considered sort of a, a subset of the magician classification? Like oh, for sure. Would you be part of the same trade group, let's say? No, we're in a different trade group, but it, it's... um. The way I describe it is you had to be a magician. There's so few mentalists that never did magic first. It's like it's almost like becoming a doctor, not doing pre-med because the foundation is the same. You build off the same things. You learn how a card trick works. You know, you have to learn. It, it, I don't know how to explain it. It's like becoming a director. You need to know what the cinematographer does. You need to know all these other skills before you can elevate to the next level. And generally speaking, mentalism is kind of, I don't want to say an upgrade. It's a little bit, that's going to be a controversial statement, but- right. It's a much steeper learning curve. You can well, practice magic tricks by yourself. You cannot practice mentalism by yourself. You need an audience. It's like stand-up comedy. Uh, that's a really interesting distinction. Yeah, you can't do mentalism in the mirror because you, you can't. Get, oh, you need a mind that's not your own. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a limiting cool. factor for why there aren't more mentalists because everyone who does it stinks for the first year, two years, three. Like like extrapolate when you can't be good right off the jump it's just almost impossible because you need to fail miserably to get better you okay. know so so that's where i want to that's where i want to i want to dig into then I, i'm veering away from my original line of inquiry around the number of magicians because i get it a mentalist isn't necessarily a magician per se so we're not let us necessarily competing with each other yeah because the, the where i was going is hey there's thousands of magicians but very few of them get on america's got talent very few of them do you know, shows for Fortune 500 companies, very few of them reach this this tier that you've reached. So, so there, and, and again, what we're after here is trying to understand what are the unlocks for superlative achievement. So, you know, let, let's keep that as the context for, for my question. But in terms of mentalism, talk me through the suck. Talk me through, you said one, two, three years of being bad at your craft. Right. I, I find that with, with outlier high achievers, there's something in them. It's not like they skip the suck phase. Yeah. There's just something in them that doesn't quit when most other people do. So talk to me about that. So I had magic as a crutch. So the, the reason I call it a crutch is because I would do mentalism and I would tiptoe. I would kind of like dip my toe in the water and then come out, dip my foot in the water and then come out, dip the leg, you know, but don't get to the belly button because you're freezing. So I would always do magic in the background. So when I end up doing that show, America's Got Talent, which I did not get on on my first attempt. Really important. People, I've kind of coached people that have been on the show. And, and the first thing I'll tell them is I didn't get on the first time. And they're always blown away. I go, I didn't even get on the show. And then the next time I went on, I got third. So remember, timing is everything in life. And for whatever reason, I think that had I got on two years before, I wouldn't have had those reps. I would probably did 600 shows, close to 600 between the time I auditioned and two plus years later, and those 600 shows, that's a real value add. Like that's kind of like the Beatles, Malcolm Gladwell, all that extra work you put in changed who you are as a performer. Like what you learned about yourself, how you learned to connect with an audience. And really important, people listening to this are mentalists. So you need to realize I'm not, a mentalist isn't what I am. I sell a product. 
That's, you should think of me as a salesperson. I don't sell entertainment. I sell memorable experiences to audiences. And that sounds like very cliche, but I'm dead serious. What I sell is that when you leave, you're going to remember that experience you had with other people deeply. And that's like, that's really a very different factor than just selling pure entertainment, which is in one ear, out the other. I create those memorable moments that people talk about for years. And knowing that distinction is what makes me much more successful than others, which is a lot of people focus inwards. Look how great I am. I don't do that in my show. I have a mirror. I'm all about making the people around me look good. The people in the room, the people that hired me, very benefits oriented. My language is benefits oriented. I am not about me. I'm about everyone else. And that's the secret to success, whether you're selling a widget, whether you're selling a service, is focus more on the person who's buying your service or who is your client, and you're going to have much bigger success. So I love, genuinely love, that you self-identified as a salesperson. I think a lot of people might shy away from describing themselves as such, like there's something wrong with that. But I, I constantly am... am T teaching or talking to entrepreneurs. Obviously, I, I run an entrepreneurial education platform. So I, I meet tons of upstart entrepreneurs. And I'm always saying, whether it's a, a new whatever that you've invented to disrupt an industry, or it's something, you know, let's say you're a plumber or a, a dentist or you own yeah, a business. Yeah, a teacher. More traditional, yeah. whatever. So learning to, to think of yourself as a marketer slash seller of blank services rather than a blank. Like, I, like right. if, if uh, for, instead of saying, I'm a dentist, think of yourself as, I'm a, I'm a purveyor of dental services. Sure. Because that's actually how you build a business, doing whatever the thing is, right? Um, and so I, first of all, I just love that you sort of boldly went right to, I'm not, a, I'm not a mentalist. I'm a seller of memorable experiences that happen to involve mentalism. So. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, it's truly the case. Um, so, okay. Uh, 600, you said 600 shows. So how many, how many shows would you say you've done in your career? I mean, I've been in this full-time professionally for 18 years and I did stuff before then, but in those 18, I've actually slowed down. I've now more quality than quantity because before AGT, my price point was much lower and I had yeah. massive volume. I mean, I'm working like, honestly, like six, seven shows a week because on the weekends I would do two per day. So yeah. God, I don't know. I like, I, I somewhere in the thousands, like probably four or 5,000. I mean, because I also did this as a teenager, I used to work restaurants like three or four a week. It's in the thousands. It's not like David Copperfield, who is the, the goat, who does, right. you know, just unbelievable. Does like 14 shows a week times 40. He's going to go down in history. But I think putting in those reps is good. But at a certain point in life, you have to also find that balance, which is uh, I'm married. I have three kids. I have a fourth kid on the way. Like, I don't want to do as many shows anymore. I'm starting to get a real sense of, you got to really hug the line between what's important in life. And so I still need to stay, stay on it and stay really topical and fresh. And I feel rusty if I don't do a show in a week or two. I mean, I recently had a week where I had two weeks off after 22 days in one month. I worked 22 days and then I somehow just by pure luck, two full weeks off and I was going crazy. Stir crap. I'm like, did I forget how to do my job? Uh, right. I, like at the deli, I looked at the guy, I'm like, think of a number. It's 27. I'm like, thank God I still got it. You know, I was getting nervous. Um, but yeah, a lot of shows and, um, I think repetition helps you to kind of polish the diamond, to get better at whatever you do, no matter what craft it is. So is, is mentalism, I have so many questions. I'm having to like choose, choose where to go with this. I'll just ask this. Fire them off rapid fire. Yeah. Yeah. So mentalism. So like, what's it like being married? You, you mentioned you're married. What is it like being married to a mentalist? Like how annoying is that? <laughs> if you're going to ask my wife. She'll probably say it's very annoying. Uh, it's probably why I love her. She keeps me on my toes. But um, generally speaking, it's not something that I'm on. I very much have two parts of my life where in my civilian life, you would literally never know. There's people that if they know me outside of this realm, they would just never know. I seem like a, I don't want to say just a normal dad and athlete, but that's most of what they know me for. I'm not pulling it out. If you had known me 15 years ago, probably much more annoying because I was doing it all the time everywhere because I was getting better, right? It was my, I needed, it's kind of like a comedian who does seven sets a night, goes to the improv, goes to the, you know, open mic, like you need those. Now I don't really practice, my shows are my practice. So at every show I'm 
developing new material, getting better at my current material. I brainstorm while I run. Um, you know, I'm constantly writing down ideas, but practice is performing. Yeah. So I, I want to, I want to touch on the running. I know you do, uh, you know, very elite endurance, uh, competitive, I think ultra marathons, but, but first I want to say this, you know, you, you referenced Malcolm Gladwell, obviously the 10,000 hours concept. I was a, uh, I'm formerly a professional jazz musician. So I had my, my, I sort of lived that life in my twenties. I was doing seven, eight, like my busiest year, I did 400 gigs, right? So more than one a day, about eight or nine per week. And so what I'll say is, you know, one of my favorite quotes, and he's a, he's a controversial figure, but he's spot on about this is, uh, is Grant Cardone. He always says, look, you either got to be obsessed or just be average, be obsessed or be average. And, and I think I, I, I want to emphasize, and, and I'd love to hear you kind of riff on this it's not enough to just do a lot of shows. Like the whole 10,000 hours concept, I think has been uh, so, sort of abused to be purely a descriptor around time. But to me, you have to be obsessed for 10,000 hours to earn mastery. And I, and I wonder if you could talk about that. I agree with you. I love the, you know, I love and hate watching myself from a few years ago because I always cringe and I always, I always see, I don't want to be a perfectionist because I try to find the good stuff and I enjoy watching certain elements, but overall I just see what I could have done better. And I think that that's one of those things that I've noticed time and again with people that I've met that are really top level is that I don't want to say they're not always happy because you find a way to find happiness with what you've done and achieved and hopefully you can, otherwise you're going to be miserable, but they're always looking for what could I have done better? And I'm always doing that with my performances, with my business, uh, and trying to analyze it. And it's funny because I've seen a lot of people that do what I do, where they're like, I'm killing it. And we have a, a trade where even if you're bad, it's like pizza, it's still good. Even bad pizza still tastes damn good. So even magicians I've seen, well, I don't want to knock anybody. I've seen their show and I, I find it to be average to maybe slightly above average. They'll get off stage and they'll just take the adoration of the crowd and they'll be like, man, I killed it. And they're not learning anything. All they're doing is taking the positive and not learning what could I have done to make it better? Where did I scale? Where would I get an extra 10%, 20%, 30%, make my show better? And I think that over the years, I've been a very harsh director with myself and learned what to improve. Um, and also the world changes. So what worked five years ago doesn't work now because social media, because attention spans, because of how people will process and, and, and kind of consume call it your content, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But that's the world we live in now. I don't even mean social media. So to answer your question, the 10,000 hours isn't enough because if you keep doing the same thing wrong for 10,000 hours, you don't get better. You need to get better with each one of those and you need to take yourself out of the equation, like your ego. I learned that at age 14 when I got my first gig. It, if I get rejected, it doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't, it's not me they rejected. It's what I did that day. And I learned that early on. It's like, I'm not going to take the, the, the hit. I'm not going to get sad and mad. I just go, oh, let me figure out a better angle. And that was the guy doing the magic. That's not me. I'm two different people. It's like an agent who represents me. So I learned that really young and I really don't get, I'll still get irritated. Listen, if somebody does something wrong business-wise or I don't get a TV show or something, I'll still be annoyed, but it doesn't hurt me internally as in, I think it's a personal attack. It's business and it's personal. I separate the two. Um, and I think that's very useful for a lot of people to get thicker skin. Yeah, you're you're touching on a, another concept that I I talk a lot about, and I've actually wrote about it some length in my book, uh, which is what I call your uh, developing your success character. Um, and the examples I use are, you know, what's it, Marshall Mathers became Eminem, uh, Beyonce goes on stage, she becomes Sasha Fierce, uh, Bo Jackson before he used to go on a football field used to become Jason from Friday the 13th and literally go out and try to kill everybody. Like having, you know, whether you, you pull a character from fiction or not, but this idea of developing sort of an alternative being for yourself to go out and do the work where the self-evaluation or the, the ego per se is, is based on the work. It's separate from, from yourself and your being. Yeah. And I feel, I feel like uh, and I've even, I mentioned, I mentioned Greg Cardone earlier. I've actually heard him talk about this, how he has sort of a cartoonified version of himself that he steps into every day to be this like 
hyper animated personality you see on the internet. I think a lot of people develop this uh, almost like third third party self that they go out to do their work with. And, and a lot of times I think that, you know, you talk about developing thick skin. Uh, what, what, how did you sort of, I, I guess, how did you come to that? I mean, again, oh, we're, we're, I can we're tell you exactly. <laughs> Most of the people that try to do these things, they stop or they right. falter. And so why didn't you? So think about this. I'm 14 years old. Okay. I, I'm by my own admission, like a nerdy teenager who is, you know, weighed like probably a hundred pounds, dripping wet, five foot, nothing. That's probably four foot, nothing. And I walk up to you. So I got my first restaurant gig. If I walk there, it's a half mile from where I lived in Farmington Hills, Michigan, how I got the balls or energy to do it. I didn't know any better. I didn't know you couldn't get a restaurant gig. So I just went in there, started doing tricks, got a gig, didn't even know what to get paid, kind of just spitballed. And then think about you walking up to a table who doesn't know who you are, who's like, who is this guy? And I just started to realize no one taught me this, but I learned sales 101, which is how do you diffuse tension? And when you walk up to a table, they don't know who you are. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know if you're hired. They don't know if you're any good. There's all these obstacles in their mind that happen in a split second, judgments. And so I started realizing, what do I do in a very short period of time? Because I'm intruding on their privacy. Some of these people are getting babysitters. They're on a night out. They do not want this person to come over and break. So I learned very quickly, like kind of power dynamics in a group, which is how do I turn the tables 180? How do I make it so that every question they ask in their mind, I answer in less than 10 seconds. Am I hired by this restaurant? What do I do? Am I any good? Do I want their money? Yes or no. What am I trying to get from them? And then shift it so that they no longer are scared of, do they want me? But now they want me more than I want them. Something very interesting, this is a, a book that was controversial, but The Game by Neil Strauss, which was all about pickup game. Right, and right. I wasn't, I wasn't using that tactic. This was way later. When I read that book, I'm like, this is what we do as magicians, is we learn how to influence people's kind of, uh, I don't want to, it's not manipulation, but learn people's desires uh, and, and how you maintain their attention in, in a very deep way. Like, how do you grip someone, their attention, and keep them? That's what misdirection is. And I learned very early on how to do that, how to work a crowd so that they wanted me. And so to answer your question, how did I have thick skin? Because I went up to tables and they were like, get out of here, man. And I was like, if you don't have thick skin and that happens to you three, four, five times in a row in a night, a lot of people will give up and they'll be like, I'm going to do something different. Yeah, it's right. A tough hit to take on a consistent basis, kind of like striking out with girls or, or with guys. Or, you know, if you go up to, to flirt with somebody and they shoot you down, you better have a thick skin to get over that and say, well, you know what? There's more fish in the sea. Or in this case, there's a lot more audiences. This is a time to learn. Do not take these, these mistakes or like these failures and let them go. Learn from them. They are the biggest lesson you'll ever have. Success isn't where you learn. It, 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 it's not helpful. It's great. It feels good. But failure is where you're going to grow. Okay. So I'm going to repeat that. Success isn't where you learn. That's like a mic drop right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that also you you touched on something that sounded really tactically significant. How to use, and I, and I want you to sort of say it, dig in a little deeper. But like it sounded like you were talking about how to use sort of rapid responses to questions to turn the tables of desire and demand, so that instead of you. It feeling like you want something from them. Now it feels like they want something from you. Could like, can you unpack that some more? Because that sounds I think, genius. I think I most know. people have a very difficult time looking at themselves objectively, right? We, we've created this image throughout our whole life of who we are and what we do. And so, for example, in my industry, the number one thing that people use to book you is called a promo reel, which is usually anywhere. It could be longer, but I would suggest two to three minute reel because that's the most anyone's going to watch to say, who is this guy, right? Hugh Jeff Lerner decided, I'm going to look up this guy who's Pearl who's on the podcast. Now, it's different because you wanted to get to know me as a person, but if you want to get to know me for hiring me for an event, mm -hmm. that video is everything. And so I will watch that video pretending like I don't know me. Like, forget, take myself out of it and say, who is this guy? What does he do? What does he have to offer? And, and I'll watch other people's videos and see what I think of them. And it's very hard to do that for yourself objectively. Now, forget about that. That's my industry. But think about that for yourself in your world. Now, let's say you're a teacher. You're not selling anything, are you? Yes, you are. You're selling attention. For your students to listen to you, what are you bringing to the table? 
if you're not interested, if you're not animated, if you're monotone, why would they be interested in you? What are you doing that's different? So I'm saying that there's always going to be outliers on a bell curve of who are the best at their job. This could be teachers, this could be salespeople, this could be movie stars, this could be mentalists, this could be podcasters. But you've got to do one of two things. You've got to be the best at what you do, or you've got to do it slightly differently than others. I learned that very early on, and that's where I tried to gravitate. Can I be the best, or can I do something different? And it doesn't have to be you're going to reinvent the wheel, but find your signature items. Find something that makes you stand out. Um, and so I learned early on, like with corporate bookings, I know very clearly who's booking me. We started to learn who is making this decision and what is important to them and learning that something important to them is, hey, we want to make sure that my boss doesn't yell at me afterwards and say, why did you, or this person was difficult to work with or find the obstacles, find the roadblocks um, and, and, and diffuse them early on. Like show them, like on my testimonials on my website, I can assure you, none of them repeat each other because I don't want you to say, oh my God, this guy was great. He had amazing tricks. Screw that. Who cares? There's a lot of other guys with amazing tricks. You want to be well-rounded. So with my, I want to show that I do a lot of preparation, that I'm there to make you look great. For a lot of things I do, I'm doing product launches, sales meetings. I want to know this company inside and out. So I provide them a value. So when they leave, they go, yo, I don't even care about the tricks. Our All our salespeople left here with more knowledge where we're like, we got an actual dollar and cents value out of you. So we're going to bring you back next year and the following year. So you want to provide value, which I know is kind of like a tacky way to put it, but everyone in life needs to provide value. I need to provide value to my kids. Like decide what is your value and then quantify it. Find out what it is. Don't just take for granted that, oh, well, I do this and this. That's not good enough nowadays. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I don't think that that, that was a long rambling answer, but I oh my got some nuggets. I, I, you provided me a, a ton of value. So thank you. I, I seriously, I, I, I don't find it tacky at all to say that you have to provide value. That's, I don't know if you, if you fed every word I've ever spoken, probably at least in the last five or 10 years into some AI machine and, you know, had it build a word cloud. I'll bet you the word value is in there pretty big and bold. Um, I, I camp on that word a lot in my mind because it is, it's the essence. I mean, as an entrepreneur, yeah, which by the way, everyone I mean, this is a strong statement. Everyone should be thinking of themselves in entrepreneurial terms. What is the value that I'm offering to the market? What is the value that I place on the value that I'm offering to the market? And am I transacting accordingly? And am I building relationships of value? Um, a value orientation to me is is the unlock for all the success that anybody wants in this world. It's why uh, Zig Ziglar said, you know, if you help enough other people get get everything they want, then you'll get everything you want. Yeah. Well, that's all value is, is delivering people what they want, right? Um, so do, do you come from like an entrepreneurial origin or family? You seem to naturally, or maybe through learned behavior, you think entrepreneurially. I think I do. I don't know where it comes from. I do think because quite young, I was, I mean, I'll give credit to my mom in this case, where as soon as I started doing magic, and this was my obsession. I, when I was 13, I saw a magician and it, I like blown away. When you talk about obsession, it was total obsession from that moment on, which I don't think you can force upon someone. It, it was innate. It was something where I was just mesmerized and I just loved the reactions. And it was very self-fulfilling where a feedback loop of, oh, I do something amazing and people like me. And it's, you know, it filled a void. My parents got divorced right then. It was a very painful, like messy split. And so I think you channel kind of like comedians channel their pain into their craft. This was something I could kind of, I would say if I could look back and therapize myself, avoid my feelings and just do this. And this gave me like an outlet. So I think that uh, she very quickly, when I said, I got to go buy a book in this trick, she's like, I'm not buying it for you. She said, go work. And so rather than being given something, I had to now invent what that meant. And quite frankly, I didn't even know what that meant because I guess I knew People were doing kids shows, but how are people going to know that they could hire me to do their eight-year-old party? And so I didn't really have any, there was no playbook for how I could be successful. So I started inventing my own. And then, like you said, mentors, I started meeting people who gave me a little more tidbits and I started emulating them or using what they taught me. And I think that's where I became very entrepreneurial young. I read a lot of books about entrepreneurs. I started to learn more about the business sense and, and quite frankly, just taking yourself out of it. I think so many people they're their own worst enemy where they become, 
I, it's not the ego that gets in your way, but you start to think of yourself in a way where you won't take that rejection or rejection will just stop you in your tracks. And I've seen it with people who didn't become professionals or didn't go for certain things in their life because they were too scared. And there is a fear there. And some of that fear is healthy. You know, if you've got like a family to feed, I wouldn't just quit your job if you don't have a plan, but create a plan, create achievable goals and work towards it so that when you're ready, it's not luck. There was no luck involved when I quit my job. I was doing tons of gigs on the side. I had set up a foundation and network and I made a very calculated, smart choice to say, hey, I can, I'm going to go for it. And if it doesn't work, I'll try to find something else. I'll go back to a job, but I set myself up for success. Be smart in your planning for when you take that moonshot. Yeah, I think you've, you've touched on a really important distinction that I, I, I think about and I, I try to sort of inculcate for myself. It's the distinction between self-consciousness and self-awareness. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people kind of resist the idea of the term ego because it, you know, it's kind of pejorative, but just being highly self-conscious um, is I think so many people's downfall. Whereas you develop what I call self-awareness, it actually becomes more objective consciousness and less self-consciousness. It's the ability to objectively self-assess by being more aware um, and less, so to speak, conscious of self. Um, and it sounds like, yeah, frankly, that sounds like probably pretty intrinsic to the work of mentalism. Can we talk a little bit about the actual, the actual practice of mentalism? Like it's, it's deeply yeah. fascinating. How, how does, like, what, what, what is the starting point for someone to go, okay, I'm going to try to develop this ability. First of all, do you think you have to have a certain innate natural ability? Whether, and, and if so, what would those abilities be? Let's start there. Uh, I think you have to be a very good listener and and have uh, a mind that's able to do things on repetition. You, you have to be able to practice and kind of analyze people really well. That happens when you're a magician though, but I hated mentalism when I was a teenager and in my early 20s because I thought it was boring. So it's very funny because I like magic moves. I like practicing card tricks and rope tricks and coin tricks. And I liked having things in my hands and that, fun, like learning new moves to, to describe it, not to geek out. But I saw a mentalist, maybe when I was 16, I'm like, this is screw this. Like they don't do anything. They go on stage right. and they guest up like that. I wanted new moves, new tricks. Like if you give me a deck of cards, I wanted a new way for you to shuffle it and me to find the four aces, like snazzy, like shoot them out and do stuff. So I think it's kind of uh, similar to like marathons. I run ultra marathons. Most ultra marathon runners tend to be older. They tend to be people in their 50s, 60s, like it's changed a little over time, but it's an, it's a, it's a more wise game because it's no longer about the physical. It's about the mental. And so with mentalism, a lot of it, for lack of a better term, can be very boring if you don't present it effectively because you're just kind of guessing stuff. So if you do that a couple of times, it will get boring unless you start thinking how to do it more effectively. So to get good at it, it's like anything. You need a deep interest and you need to jump in full tilt. It's like, let's say you want to learn how to edit video. You're going to start watching YouTube videos. Nowadays, YouTube's not going to be a good revelation because most people that post how to do stuff, they get it completely wrong because they're not mentalists, a tight knit circle. But books, videos, quite frankly, almost anything in the world can be learned now. Any, let's say you want to learn about private equity. You don't even get an MBA. Read, go watch YouTube for eight hours a day for the next three months, talk to people, sit down at lunches, you will, I'm not going to say you're going to suddenly do this craft, but there's almost nothing you couldn't learn nowadays by just buying a few books, watching videos and having an obsession. So I did that. I started meeting mentalists. I started, you know, buying them lunch, begging, you know, beg, borrow and steal to be like, show me how you did that. Show me, teach me this. And just starting to learn stuff and develop my own character and realize who is my persona when I perform. And why should somebody watch me? Why should somebody be interested? What is it that I'm presenting that's of value to other people rather than let me show you cool stuff about me? I learned early on that's not where I'm going to shine. I'm going to make it about my audience. So that's, that's a, I actually really appreciate, I mean, being someone that's in the self-education industry with my, my business, my main business, I really appreciate that answer of like, look, it, you know, the place to start is you go out and you seek the information because Anything you want to learn is out there, and I, I deeply believe that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about these ultra marathons. Um, 
First of all, how'd you get into that? I mean, that's a pretty intense hobby so, so to speak. i started doing marathons when i was 22 my older sister ran the new york city marathon i am not a runner like by background i didn't run in college in high school i ran one season of cross country and track and i was terrible i quit i was the worst guy on the team literally like i always people i've said this in podcasts before they're like oh you mean no no i was literally if you looked at the times i was the last guy on our team uh so i was not cut out for it i hated running and so I um, was working a desk job and I started, you know, going to happy hours, you're drinking, you're eating crap, you're sedentary. I didn't really get fat. I just kind of like started getting soft and just, I got miserable. I started saying, is this what my life is? Like, yes, I'm making good money and it's very hard. I don't want to for a second not have gratitude that I had a job, that I was working for a company and had health insurance and like so many things that 200 million people would listen to this and be like, I'd kill for. So I'm not saying that, but I felt like there had to be more to life. Like this can't be my next 30, 40 years. I, so marathons became a race, became something that I write in my calendar that forces me to get healthy, to get in shape and to have accountability where I tell people about it. And now God help me if I don't do it. Cause people are gonna be like, yo, what happened to that race you were going to do, bro? And so, you know, tuck your tail between your legs and say, oh, I didn't do it. I don't want those excuses. I don't want that crap. I'm going to do it. I say I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so I did the first one. I didn't do well. And I got hooked. And I started training more effectively. I started reading books. It's kind of like what I did with magic. How do I get better? And I love the high and I like the creative juices that flow. When I'm running, I come up with my best stuff for business, for I'm writing a book right now for my book, for ideas, for when I do TV appearances. 90% of it is when I'm running. 10% is in the shower or like other places where my kind of brain waves zero, like they, they just level out and I'm not thinking of you know, what's on my phone or what my kids are doing. It just kind of, you zone out and you get creative. Um, and then the ultra marathons, I read a book by Dean Carnassus, who's my boy, I love Dean, called The Ultra Marathon Man. Even if you don't like running, this book is out of this world. You'll read it in a day or two. I read that book and then I was like, full steam, I got to do some ultras. And I got, I got hooked. Have you ever read a book called The Fighter's Mind by no. Sam Sheridan? No, should I add it onto the Kindle? I, I would put it on the list. Yeah, it, okay. it basically looks at all these different, uh, really extreme athletes. So there's a lot of MMA, you know, kickboxers. Uh, it has Dan Gable, the famous Olympian wrestler. Um, Wait, there's also, doubt. Uh, and, uh, has uh, an, an ultra marathoner profiled in there. And it's really just about people that take themselves to the edge in terms of mental discipline and self-regulation. Um, it's, it, it's one of my favorite books. It really, really impacted me a lot. I read it, gosh, in my twenties probably. Um, but ever since I read it, I've been, uh, I've been pretty sort of fascinated and enthralled with the concept of doing ultra marathons. I've never done one. I, I actually, um, trained for a marathon once and had to stop because I started to develop a, my, my hip joint was like deteriorating as a whole thing. I'm actually going to get stem cells in a couple months to finally deal with it years later. But, um, well, thank you. Yeah, because I, but, but here's what I'll say is when I was running, you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80 miles a week, I think I actually got up close to hundred miles one week, um, in training for it. I, I loved what it did to my mind. In yeah. fact, the business I have now, the big blue ocean idea that led to the formation of this business came to me, at, you know, about 14 miles into a long training run. And uh, it's just incredible. So maybe you could talk a little bit about like the war, if you will, the war in your own mind when you're pushing through and, and how, how long the races do you run? Uh, I mean, the longest race I've ever run is called Spartathlon. It's a 153 mile run. It's from Athens to Sparta in Greece. I've run the Bad Water race, which is like oh. the world's toughest for It's 135 miles. It's in Death Valley in the summer. So when I started the race, it was 124 degrees. Uh, that's not like a typo. So it feels like you're in an oven. Okay. Um, so yeah, talk to me about the war then. You've, you've fought the war, it sounds like. You know what? It's kind of one of those things where you mentally, you get to the point where it's, it's, it's mostly mental. Like the physical, everyone goes through hell and, and gets broken down. But there's people at these races that are 20 years older than me, 25 years older than me. And, and just objectively, in every measurable facet, less fit than I am. Do you understand what I mean? Who I, this only happened twice where I haven't finished races, but I came back breathing fire, ready to finish, but, or beat me. And the reason is because mentally they were ready. They, they like, there's that, 
mentality, this race Spartathlon, uh, the first year I did it, it's 153 miles. I didn't finish. I got to the halfway point. I quit. I was thrown up for eight hours. Excuses. I still believe I could have finished, but mentally I wasn't prepared for running for a day and a half straight, which I know people are going to listen to this and be like, you're a psycho, but yeah, literally running for 36 hours nonstop. And so I saw a guy who, when, when I talked to him, like his eyes were open. It looked like you're watching somebody from like Titanic, like sinking, clawing their life. Like they were, and, and, and he said, to me, what do you mean you're going to stop? And he goes, if you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl. Like you, like he, I, I mean, I'm telling you, like just feeling it now, my heart rate's going up because this guy channeled, like I will not quit unless I die. And I, I never knew if you could like distill that, take a shot of it and, and shoot it in your arm. Like I got that essence from this guy and I internalized it. And the next year when I came back, I had it. And I go, there's just no way I'm not finishing this race. Not talk, not like self-talk to get into myself. I knew it in my soul. And so I didn't have that the first year. And I think that once you do that and you finish it, and again, this is a ridiculous premise. Most people listening to this, you're right. It's probably not good for your body. It's probably stupid, but it's that cliche. What's your Mount Everest? doesn't matter what it is, but whatever you decided, once you decide you draw a line in the sand and I'm going to do this, whatever it is, do it. And like, there's no excuses. Don't give me this or that afterwards. Cause you're lying to yourself you can find a way to do it. And for me, that race was one of them. And every race becomes that next thing that I do that kind of makes the rest of life easier. And that's what I like about ultras. I like the challenge. I like getting there and not knowing if I'll finish and proving to myself I can. Man, I I just love, I love stuff like this. You know, you, you've touched on a couple of times a principle that I first sort of extracted from Robert Cialdini's influence, uh, which is commitment and consistency. Another great book. Yeah, great. And and he talks about how marketers use it to kind of hook people into purchasing things by having them make small commitments that they then behaviorally and psychologically want to appear consistent with. So they'll end up buying something larger just to appear consistent with something they did earlier that was smaller. Right. But you can use this on yourself. You said sure. earlier, like if I tell people that I'm going to run a marathon, I do not want to face them with my story, my excuse of why I didn't follow through. Right. Right. And in integrity is just doing what you say you're going to do, keeping your commitments. And if you're unable to, it's proactively making a new commitment. Um, so, you, you know, basically you're just describing integrity. And if you have integrity, you can accomplish virtually anything simply by declaring that you're going to do it. Right. So, so I, I, I just, I love that. Um, I know we're, we're unfortunately about out of time. I know we have a, we have a hard stop coming up. Uh, you know what? Let's do something cool. You're asking me about okay. mentalism. It's kind of okay. like asking somebody to describe a song. It's not as fun as experiencing it. So how about this? Let's, let's imagine this situation because your job unlock potential, right? You want to get to speak with interesting people and give your listeners some new perspective, some new nugget. If they can just take away one thing from this conversation, it's a win. It's like when I learn a new mentalism, if I get one new trick in my act, I'm sold. So how about this? I'm on Zoom with you, right? Before today, we had never met, never spoken in our life before today. Is that correct? I want them to know that. That is absolutely correct. Yes, sir. We are meeting like, literally until a few hours ago. I a few know. hours ago. Here's what we do. Imagine that my Zoom screen disappears, goes black, and suddenly insert, okay, now this could be somebody alive or dead. I like to describe this to people because I make it hypothetical. If I make it just living people, you feel kind of pigeonholed. And you're having a scintillating conversation with somebody famous that you either find fascinating, interesting, or you have a huge, you're a huge fan of their work. And, and I, I, I'm not gonna get in depth on this person. I'm not gonna ask you facts about them, but I'm assuming you know quite a bit about them. Can you picture this person's face right now as if they're in the Zoom screen with you? Yes. Okay. Now, just to make this clear, I said dead or alive, right? But the way you enunciate, the way you kind of lead the witness is, I wanted you to think in a certain way, which is, I could get somebody that's alive. So hear me out on this, Jeff. I kind of made it less, uh, less enticing to go with somebody alive. So I'm going to put money. You thought of somebody dead, did you? Am I right? I did. Of course I did. Because yes. you said if it's somebody alive, I could do it. But it, what's impossible is getting somebody back from the dead. And I want you to think of this person's first name. Can you do that for me right now? Think of their first name. And then I want you to think of their last name. Can you do that for me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now here, everyone that's listening you miss something, which is visual cues, which is why it's hard for me to do this purely on the radio, is what your eyes did is the same thing that your 
thumb does. What does your thumb do on a keyboard, Jeff? Think about it right now. What does your thumb do on the keyboard? Like on a computer keyboard? Yes. What does it hit? What's the button? A thumb? Oh, the space bar. If that's correct. And why in the world would you hit a space bar with your eyes? You jumped when I said the first name. That's very rare. Nobody does that. When you think of the name Jeff Lerner, you don't jump. You know why you did that? Because the name is either two names or two initials. It's two letters. C.S. Lewis is who you thought of, isn't it? Bro, that's trippy, dude. Yes, 100%. In fact, that the, when you said his first name, I was thinking, I don't actually know his first name. I just know C.S. Exactly. Jump between the letters, and I knew it. I knew you were thinking of an author. How about this? Let's go. Wow. Let's okay. do something impossible. Let's dig deep. We don't even have time for a reaction. Jeff's like, wait, what the hell just happened in my brain? I want the listener to know. He just literally thought of anybody. And just based on his eye expression, that's how we figured out the name. I want you to go back in time, and I want to ask you a question. Is there anyone that would know the name of your first grade teacher? Would your family members? Uh, my, I don't think my dad would remember. My mom would remember, but she passed away two years ago, so I think you're so safe. sorry. You know what? I don't want to do a first grade teacher because that's in the public realm. People can know where you grew up. This is something I find no one knows. Maybe your best friend when you were a kid, but your first crush, the first girl and boy you ever had a crush on, this could have been puppy love, kindergarten, whatever. But that I find nobody knows because you never, did you ever go out with this person? Did it ever come to fruition? It was no, just a, no, I was spurns multiple spurn, times. Exactly, unrequited love. Yes, I, the only person know. that would know this would be my best friend who I met in driver's ed and he makes fun of me all the time about it. Call him afterwards, I ask if I talk to him. He's gonna be like, I don't know. Here's what you do. Um, uh, would, would you have said this is a first big crush or more of like a minor crush? How would you have described it? No, this is, this was my first like love lorn. Perfect. 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 Do this. Do this. Yeah. Think of the first letter of the name. And now I want you without using your fingers to count the number of letters in this first name strictly to yourself. Please do not say it when you're done. Just count in your head when you're done. Say, I'm got it. I'm done. Just say, got it. Got it. That took a little while. That was fascinating because if the name is short, if the name is, you know, Beth, Pat, like, you know, like okay. if it's a very short name, it's very quick to count. You don't even, you almost just look at me and you, you, you rush me, but you struggled a little and you squinted a little bit and you were like, how many? And so you broke it up. Most names you can break up. Like if the name is Mary Beth, you think Mary Beth, four and four. And what you did, what it looked like is you broke up the beginning and then you broke up the next part. I'm not sure I'm going to get the number right, but I'm going to tell you it's one of two. I think it's nine or 10 letters. Am I right that it's one of those? It's nine or 10? It's nine. Oh, no, you'd have to tell me, but that's okay. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going on a fishing expedition. Okay. Then, nine letters, nine letters. It's like Wheel of Fortune now. How many names are there with nine letters? A ton. And I want you, again, to focus on the first letter and keep going. Jeff, I'm not saying you would do this, but somebody cuts you off in rush hour traffic. You get a little mad, road rage. You turn around and you know what you say? You go, you've... I didn't even say the word, but your listener knows what word I was implying because they bit their lower lip. F, Francesca is her name, isn't it? Dude, first of all, that's kind of embarrassing because like people know her and me and they might hear this, but like whatever, I had a crush on you, Franny, that's no shock in like fifth grade or whatever. Yes, Francesca, what the, what the F, dude? That's trippy. And Jeff, you want me to give it to you? Here's the best thing, which is, how to get to the Wait, NBA. you're saying I bit my lip? Like I'm yeah. saying there was a lot of things I saw, but listen to this. To get the yeah. NBA is one out of thousands, right? Of kids that play in high school and then take it to the next level of college. But how do you become LeBron? So for me, how do I push my show to the limit? You asked me 10,000 hours and we said get better. So you just thought of your first big crush, Francesca. Do you have a pad of paper there? Can you write something down? Uh, I can take notes on my phone. Oh, so, uh, well, do you don't have a piece of paper? Because I want you to write it big. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, do it on your phone. Do it on your phone, but I don't want people okay. to think there's a phone involvement because like Wi-Fi, I don't know. I would think it's a trick. Don't write anything. You know what? Screw it. Don't write anything. You thought of Francesca, but you were like, this is my big first crush. So you, in your head, popped in your first crush, but what if in your mind, you weren't even thinking of her, you were debating people and I was watching you and you were like, yeah, that was my big first crush, but I was thinking of somebody else and this is where you get LeBron level. I'm going to try to get the name that popped in your head first and you don't even know what you thought of this person, shorter name. It doesn't start with an R. It's not Rachel. There's an R in the name, am I right? And you were like, first grade Laura was your first crush, wasn't it? Bro, Laura Carter, sixth grade, shot me down, 
that was the first person I thought of, but then I thought, no, Francesca was a bigger crush that lasted for years. Damn. You, guys, O's in that minute. house. Unlock your potential, folks. <laughs> wow. Nothing okay. is impossible. No, I am I am convinced. Do, do, are you, do you perform publicly? I probably can't crash a corporate event. I want to cost uh, you. crash a corporate event. Show up in a suit and tie. I, I do perform publicly, not as often. I'm not like touring the way a band would. But the best way to find me is going to be social. I tend to be very active on Instagram, not as much on Facebook, but Instagram is my biggest one and Twitter. And it's at OZ. It looks like Oz. Blame my parents. It's actually pronounced O's, but at OZ The Mentalist. You're going to see me on Instagram and I post all my dates. I do a lot of charity fundraisers. I believe in giving back so you can buy tickets to those. And I do some theaters and casinos at various parts of the year. I'm, I'm legitimately mind blown. Okay, Instagram, Twitter. I know you have ozperlman.com if anybody wants to learn more about your offerings. Uh, dude, this has been amazing. I know you're about to go have dinner with your wife who, yep. in all seriousness, probably isn't annoyed by you. <laughs> I love her. Just, the you're... best decision I ever made in life, hands down, was marrying her. So just know that she was the right partner in life. Amen. Well, thank you so much, so much for being a guest on Unlock Your Potential. I, I'm always mind blown by my conversations, but I've never quite been mind blown like this. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. We're actually born with a possible mindset. This thing that I teach, this empowered way of thinking, this limitless belief and limitless possibilities. We're born with that. But society, unfortunately, and the growing fear and anxiety and the dinging of our phones actually trains that out of us.